another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. We're also on the iTunes podcast store, but they only show the last five episodes or so. If you go to our website, rce-cast.com, you can find all the old shows there. There's an RSS feed added directly to your Google Reader or your feeder of choice. Uh, also, you can find links to all of our Twitter accounts and Jeff's wonderful MPI blog and everything else. And that also means that, once again, I have Jeff Squires, one of the authors of Open MPI and from Cisco Systems. Uh, Jeff, thanks again for your time. Sure, Brock. This is good stuff. And, uh, you know, it really does just roll off the, to- the tongue, doesn't it? rce-cast.com. It just yeah. kind of rolls right off there, and you can get all the old episodes and things like that. Hey, so uh, there's a couple of dates coming up here that are probably worth mentioning. Um, I will mention the first one here. So the Euro MPI uh, conference papers uh, this year were in Spain, which is going to be pretty fun. I don't think we've had Euro MPI there before. Uh, but the due dates for papers are at the end of this month, March 29th. So if you're not already working on your paper, you need to be working on it. Also, uh, I will actually be one of the speakers at Globus World this year, which is at Argonne National Lab down there by Chicago, and that is April 16th through 18th. So remember, we've had Globus on the show before, and they're coming out with some new features to their Globus Online product, which I hope to get Steve and some of those guys on the show to talk about some of the changes they're making for their web tool, which we didn't cover much in the original Globus podcast uh, after they announce their new features and stuff they're coming out with there. So I will be there. So if you're there, get a hold of me. Cool. All right. Well, what are we talking about today, Brock? Uh, Today we have something that I am only anecdotally uh, familiar with, and hopefully, Jeff, you can help out a little bit more with this one. I just came in a request from a couple of different users. Uh, We're talking about Chapel, which I believe is a new language for scientific computing, um, which a lot of the heavy lifting there is being done by Cray. Uh, We have two guests with us, Brad Chamberlain and uh, Sung Choi. Uh, Guys, how about you take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Brad Chamberlain. I'm uh, an employee here at Cray Inc., um, a principal engineer, and I'm the technical lead for the Chapel Project, which means I oversee the design and development of the language. Hi, uh, I'm Sung Choi. Um, I'm a senior developer with the group, and I also work at Cray um, and working closely with Brad. Okay, so uh, I threw out what I thought Chapel was there. Please correct me. What exactly is Chapel? Your explanation was pretty good. So Chapel is a new parallel language that we're developing at Cray. Um, we're doing it in partnership with other members of the community, uh, primarily from academia and government. Um, I think the one thing you said... So Chapel is very much um, designed to be usable for scientific computing at large scale, but we've also tried to make it a very general parallel language such that it's also attractive potentially to desktop parallel programmers who want to make use of the multi-core processors that they have, for example. So how did Chapel get started? And and along with that, you said, you know, there's various academia and government uh, involved. Who, Who exactly are the other organizations involved? Oh, there's a long list of other organizations. Um, so Chapel is, well, let's see. Let me start with how it got started, maybe, and we'll get, come back to the who else is involved. Um, so I think the short version of the story is that uh, Chapel is something that came out of the DARPA HPCS program. So HPCS is a program that started in 2001, 2002, uh, with the goal of improving productivity on high-end systems. So the observation was that we're very good as a community at making faster and faster machines, but maybe not necessarily good at making them easier and easier to use. And so Cray was one of the participants in this program, and we looked at our systems, sort of everything from processor design, network, memory, all the way up to software, um, compilers, tools. And part of that was we thought that languages were an area where um, the community could really benefit from some new technologies and have improved productivity. Um, So that's Chapel came out of that program, essentially. It was part of Cray's entry in the program. So, actually, so can you touch on, so it was DARPA, but I assume it's, uh, I mean, did Cray just get the contract for this, or who are some of the other contributors to this project? Yeah, so, um, let's see. So, initially, the HPCS program had uh, five teams, and it was went down to three, and then down to two. So... At the point that the languages were coming about, um, there were three teams, IBM, Sun, and Cray. Um, each team uh, came up with a language that they thought would improve productivity. So we uh, worked on Chapel. IBM developed a language called XN, and Sun developed a language called Fortress. 
Um, and then there's a Downflex and uh, Chaplin and uh, IBM, or sorry, Cray and IBM were um, chosen to go into phase three of the program and continue doing their developments. Um, so Chapel's been, even though Cray was spearheading the effort, it's been designed as an open source effort. Uh, so all along we've been encouraging of people um, throughout the community who are interested in participating or contributing uh, to do so. And so um, you asked before about what other organizations are collaborating. So um, there have been a number of people at National Labs, um, Oak Ridge, Livermore, um, Argonne, that we've uh, pursued collaborations with, um, and others. Um, and then we have academics at uh, where University of Colorado Boulder, um, some overseas at the University of Malaga, um, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Um, and so actually, uh, there's probably a few dozen organizations altogether who've participated at one time or another. Um, I have trouble remembering them all off the top of my head. Can you think of others that I'm notable and I'm forgetting it? University of Colorado, UIUC, um, Berkeley Labs. University of Tokyo, uh, Rice University. Yeah, so it, 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 there's been a lot of interest in, in working on it, and I think the open source nature of it has been very encouraging of, of people to join in and contribute where they can. Um, which has been encouraging. So that's quite an impressive uh, list of organizations. What is it about Chapel that uh, brought them together? I mean, uh, put a different way, why do we need yet another parallel programming paradigm slash language slash model? What, what is different about Chapel that makes it better? Yeah, so let me start with the part of the question, why do we need another model? Um, so while there have been a number of uh, attempts at designing parallel languages over the years, and people love to haul out the lists of, you know, the dozens or hundreds of languages that have failed, you know, since the 90s or 80s or whenever, um, the fact of the matter is the number that have actually caught on and succeeded um, is quite small. Um, so, you know, MPI has obviously been successful if you're willing to count that as language, and I usually do because I think it really impacts the way you program. Um, and OpenMP is successful, and UPC has had some success, and Cori Fortran has been adopted into Fortran standard. Um, but by and large, I think uh, we feel that there haven't been any really great parallel languages. Um, most of the parallel systems that are out there are good at certain things, like certain styles of parallelism, like maybe SPMD parallelism or task parallelism, um, but typically not sort of at a broad swath of different kinds of parallelism, say data parallelism and task parallelism and concurrency and nested parallelism and pipeline parallelism. Um, so they sort of have their one thing they do well. The other thing is most parallel languages we have only target a single granularity of parallelism. So MPI, UPC, and Cori Fortran are sort of process level SPMD parallelism. Things like OpenMP and pthreads are thread or task level parallelism. Um, but again, there's not sort of a single language that allows you to talk about different granularities or styles of parallelism all in one unified way. And um, I think this has also been the failure of some of the academic languages is that they sort of by nature in an academic language, you pick the one thing you want to work on that's novel, you work on that, and um, you maybe have some successes there, but the language is not broad enough to be sort of hit that tipping point where people get excited about it. And at Chapel, when we started out, we decided to go really big, like to be very general. Any parallel algorithm you can think of, any kind of parallel hardware you can imagine wanting to target, you ought to be able to do that in Chapel. Um, and I think that while that makes it very... Uh, audacious, you know, can we actually pull this off? I think it also sort of um, is the thing that makes Chapel more unique, more different. It's just incredibly general in, in the scope of what it's trying to do. And I think that's been a lot of the appeal as far as why are people interested in using it or in participating in it as well. Um, so, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, so mostly I just want to add to uh, extend on what Brad had just said, which is that um, since Chapel is a general language, it has a broad appeal and it brings together people from um, all swaths of the community, you know, people just who are interested in languages as well as parallel systems and runtime systems. And that gives it a, um, a lot of attention in the academic community. Yeah, let, me, let me pop back in. I think one other thing that makes it really appealing to people, um, in addition to all the features that we talked about in terms of you know, general support for parallelism and, um, and locality, which we haven't talked about as much. Um, it also, we, we very much tried to make it a very much more modern feeling language. So most languages we're using in HPC are still very, you know, Fortran C, C++ based. But if you talk to young programmers, they're using 
you know, Java, maybe C Sharp, Python, things like that. And we really designed Chapel to have that more modern sort of, um, both in a type-safe manner and in sort of the scripting kind of way, like you can leave off types of variables and things like that. And so a lot of times we get people who are Python users who are just really excited about Chapel because it feels the most like programming in Python that they've seen um, in a parallel machine. And that, that's really enticing to them as opposed to using that something that's C-based or Fortran-based or something like that. So to get to put it a little concretely, so that was the first thing you said there is that it's, it's is it kind of like Python? Is that what you're saying, or is it just kind of analogous to the people who are are used to it? I mean, can you put it in a, a few grounded terms that what what does modern uh, mean to you, for example? Yeah, so I think modern means so it, it's not actually based on Python, and in fact, interestingly, um, I when we started this project, I was really ignorant of Python. Like I'd heard the name, but I never really looked at it. And David Callahan, who was one of the other early architects on the language, um, similarly was not really a Python user, didn't really know much about it. Um, so the thing I think that people see there is more, we knew we wanted to give sort of that more productive, like, I don't have to type the type of every single variable. I don't have to type the type of every single um, argument or return type of my functions. And we wanted that more sort of fast and loose scripty kind of feel, but yet still have it be a completely statically typed language where the compiler figured out all the types, and you know you, you would end up with the same kind of performances you get in a statically typed language like C or Fortran. So that sort of feel of like being able to sketch out code quickly um, and not sort of specify every single thing was definitely a theme in the language. And the similarities to Python are more circumstantial than anything. I think we just ended up with some concepts that made sense to us that turned out to be similar to things in Python, and there's been a certain amount of crossover between those communities as a result. Um, the other thing I associate with modern languages is uh, a lot more object orientation, a lot more type safety, um, the sort of bulletproofness that you expect out of like a Java or C Sharp. And so we went more that route than, say, C, which is obviously a very permissive language in terms of allowing you to, to do things. Um, but it sort of probably straddles the line between the two because at the same time we needed to retain the performance uh, in order to compete with things like C. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, actual parallel features. I mean, I, I assume this was kind of a core thing from the beginning. You said you wanted to touch on everything, but I mean, I think of more like one-sided operations, synchronous operations, partition global address space operations. I mean, do you just re-implement those same kind of functionality? Did you come up with anything unique? And what one of those did you think uh, Chapel came out as implementing the best in the Chapel way? Mm-hmm. Well, so in that sort of taxonomy you went through, um, different styles of communication or PGAS-like languages, we normally uh, say that Chapel is a PGAS language, or rather than PGAS, I kind of prefer the term um, partition global namespace, uh, because normally in PGAS languages, you're not actually talking about addresses, you're just naming variables. And it's the fact that you can name a variable and access it, whether it's local or remote, that sort of gives it that PGAS-like feel. Um, so in terms of, as a programmer, when you think about sort of communication, you're not doing sends and receives or explicit puts and gets. You're just referring to variables. And the variables may be local, in which case you'll just access them locally, or they may be remote, in which case the compiler and runtime will do the communication for you. Um, and semantically in the model, you can reason about and control where your data is allocated on the machine, where tasks are running on the machine. So you have full ability to reason about locality, um, but you don't necessarily have to you know, it doesn't trip you up at every step because you're not doing explicit communication. Um, so it is very PGAS-like in that sense. Uh, at the same time, it's very different than the traditional PGAS languages like UPC and Core and Fortran. And I would say the big difference is those languages use a static SPMD model where at the beginning of time you fire off, you know, K copies of your program, and that's your parallelism from the beginning of time till the end. And in Chapel, we've made parallelism and locality very orthogonal concepts in the language. So we have one concept that talks about locality, you know, What's on this node? What's on that node? What's here? What's there? And then we have other concepts for talking about parallelism. I'd like to run this loop in parallel or spawn up some parallel tasks to do the other thing. And by separating those two concerns, which I think are very different concerns, um, I think that's one of the things that really sets Chapel apart from this language. They either use the same thing for both, which is what the, SPM, the SPMD model gives us, or they just don't have a notion of locality at all, which is where we are with like OpenMP and P-threads. So... To, to, to be able to get good performance out of one of these things, because something you may try to access may be very, very far away, or 
I, I could see it being very easy to write something and prototype it real quick, and yes, it'll run in parallel, but the performance is not going to scale very well, and then you would need to give it extra information about where you kind of want stuff laid out. Uh, where does Chapel fall? Do you need to be explicit, or is it completely freeform, or is it like it's completely freeform, but you can give it hints? <laughs> um, so your characterization is correct. Um, there is this tension between being able to sketch things out quickly, get them up and running, and then you know, accidentally shooting yourself in the foot in terms of performance. And um, I think that's a tension where sort of chapels at one end of the spectrum and MPIs on the other. Um, and we sort of intentionally, as a result of the productivity angle of this program, said that we were going to go after that more productive solution where you could sort of, you know, you could write things very quickly, but you might do really bad things. Um, so as you're training for performance, you are going to go into your code. Um, you're going to be looking for places where, you know, you're doing more communication than you meant to. And you're going to do, you know, you're going to maybe rearrange your data in order to have it local in memory or cache things so that you're not communicating quite so much. So in designing language, uh, one of the things we really thought was important was sort of respecting the 90-10 rule, um, where sort of, you know, if 90% of your time is spent in 10% of your code, it's a shame that in a lot of our programming models, you're sort of paying the cost of dealing with locality very, very explicitly sort of in 100% of your code. Um, and so the ability to sort of, write a bunch of code, and then focus in on the part that you really care about and tune for locality there and tune the communication very carefully there, um, we think really aids in productivity. Um, yeah. Anecdotally, uh, I've been teaching a class over at University of Washington this quarter, and I taught my students both MPI and Chapel. The tension was very apparent to them. Um, a simple example was they wanted to print out a distributed array, and in MPI, that's sort of amazingly painful. If you want to print it out as sort of one coherent whole, you have to take turns printing, and depending on your file system, you may even have to be very, very careful that the file system doesn't reorder things on you. Um, in Chapel, you just say, print out the array. So that's an example where the productivity helps you, and if you're doing that just at the beginning or end of your program, you don't care about the performance. Um, but then on the, other, on the other hand, in Chapel, there were times where they were accidentally accessing something that was non-local without realizing it, because it's so easy to do. Um, and you know, until you go in and start counting your communications and seeing what's happening, you, you can easily miss the fact that you should have localized something or distributed it and didn't. Um, so there's definitely a tension there. So you mentioned that this is a very high-level language um, and that it, it has all these modern feels to it, untyped variables and things like that. How do you interact with the you know, underlying system itself, like the network calls and things like that? Is that all basically completely hidden away, or is that implemented in C under the covers, or how does that work? So uh, basically, uh, in terms of interacting with the lower level system, uh, we have a runtime system that uh, is implemented in C uh, for now. And um, the calls from the compiler and within Chapel modules, Chapel modules are sort of, you can think of them as libraries that are written in Chapel that are supporting every um, program. Uh, there are calls into the runtime there. And uh, we have separate, what we sometimes call layers, that support different types of communication, threading, tasking, um, memory allocators, and things like that. Uh, so this is something that a user will not see. Um, we haven't really talked about... Um, so we talked about the high-level constructs, but there are ways to drop down uh, and use sort of lower-level constructs. And you could essentially drop all the way down and make C calls also. Okay, so that's actually uh, an important point. So Chapel can interact with other middleware out there? Like there's you know, zillions of C and Fortran-based numerical libraries. Is there a way to make those interoperate? Um, so one of the things we think is really important in Chapel is that you not have to throw away all your previous code. And so um, interoperability is a big part of that story. So one of the capabilities we have today is a uh, capability within the language where you can declare external types or variables or functions, for example, in C, and then you can call from your Chapel code out to those functions. Um, we also have a desire and an initial effort toward uh, supporting calls in the reverse direction. So if you want to take your C program, and rewrite the middle of that in Chapel, you could call into a Chapel program. And that's ongoing work. And then for a broader interoperability story, we've been working with the Babel and Braid team at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And they have a system in which they support interoperability between sort of all the major languages that HPC cares about. Um, it's using a hub-and-spoke model. And so they have a spoke for Chapel, which allows them to interoperate with 
um, Fortran, Python, Java, C, C++, and that, that's, a, so that's a much broader and stronger story than the one we have built into the compiler. Um, I guess something that hasn't come up is Chapel actually uses a source-to-source uh, -source compilation technology. So we, our compiler sort of compiles all the parallelism and the locality kinds of aspects down to scalar C code and these calls to the runtime that Sung mentioned. Um, so that makes interoperability with C very easy. And then we rely on the back-end C compiler to do the lower-level optimizations that are specific to the processor and the machine that we're targeting. Now, one thing I want to jump back a little bit in the conversation that it strikes me I, I didn't get a chance to ask about it earlier. You were talking about the, the concept of locality. Um, what... Well, what is it? What do you expose? Do you expose, you know, a, a processor core or a, a cache or a memory locality? What, what is your concept of locality? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, so Chapel has a concept in the language. It's um, like a built-in type you can think of it as being that is called a locale. And a locale is sort of intentionally somewhat abstract. It basically is a part of your target architecture that supports the ability to run tasks, which is to say it has a processor, and store variables, which is to say it has memory. So typically these locales on a cluster, say, would be mapped down to a single compute node. Um, so anything within that locale would be running with the cores of that compute node and stored in the memory of that compute node. Um, and anything in another locale would be in another compute node somewhere across the network. Um, so in the traditional PGAS model, you can access variables whether they're on your locale or a different locale. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, cost, basically. So obviously, accessing things that are local to you is going to be cheaper and preferable, um, particularly from a scalability standpoint, but you still can name things that are stored in other locales. Um, now, you asked about uh, mapping these locales down to something finer grain, like a single core or a single memory or something like that. Um, that's something we haven't done much with yet, but it's an area of ongoing research within the group currently. Um, so as our node architectures get more um, heterogeneous and have deeper hierarchies or more sensitivity to locality within the node, one of the things we're looking at is supporting locales within locales. So that you could talk about, this locale represents my compute node, but then within there I have a sublocale that talks about the CPU resources and a sublocale that talks about the GPU resources. Um, so that's an area of ongoing work. Today our locales are just sort of um, a single top-level non-hierarchical concept that allow you to talk about horizontal locality, but less about vertical locality. So what about the actual communication part? The, uh, how does things move between nodes, and does it only work on a Cray? Okay, so those are two pretty different questions. Uh, so taking the first one, uh, how do things move between nodes? So um, one of the things you have at your disposal in Chapel is something we call an on clause. And so with the on clause, you can say something like, on locale number three, or you can use it in a data-driven manner and say, on the locale that's storing variable x, and then any text within that compound statement will be executed on that locale. And so this is the primary way in which you move computation around the machine, is you use these on clauses to say, you know, go do this over there. Um, you can also uh, use these on clauses to allocate data on different locales. And then there's also a high-level concept called a distribution, similar to distributions in the HPF and ZPL languages of the 90s. It allows you to talk about taking an entire array and distributing it. So that's how you distribute your data across the machine. And then to the communication itself happens just by naming variables that happen to be on a different locale. So for example, if I declare a variable x, and then I use an on clause to move my task to a different locale, it can still refer to x because it still sees it in its lexical scope. But that reference to x is going to require puts and gets over the network to store and load that variable x. Uh, I guess uh, one that's really interesting how you're doing that where it's, it's more like a, a data-centric uh, communication rather than just a, like a, a byte address-centric communication. But right. what I was actually getting at is, you know, you're using the language to language to compiler so that you're utilizing the already well optimized C compiler to produce your machine language. Are you using what are are you doing a similar thing for communication? Like, are you just relying on existing optimized MPI methods, um, and or is this something that relies specifically on like a Cray Torus network? And thus, I could never run this on something else. I see. I see. Okay. Um, so. Uh, in terms of the communication, uh, as Sung mentioned, we have this runtime communication layer, and it supports things like um, puts and gets and active messages, and you can map that down to any underlying technology that supports it. So traditionally, and by default, we tend to use the GasNet communication layer that comes out of Berkeley, because it has very good support for puts and gets and active messages, which are sort of the three main constructs we need. 
And so they've taken the burden of doing a lot of work of tuning this down to specific um, network hardware capabilities, as well as providing very general implementations that run over UDP or MPI or things like that. Um, so typically, that's the approach we take for communication. Um, we do have an implementation that's targeted directly to Cray networks, so that um, you know bypasses GasNet and goes directly down to the network, since that's something we know about in-house. And we've talked a lot with the MPI3 team, uh, particularly at um, Argonne, about uh, doing an implementation over MPI3 to make use of some of the new single-sided communication constructs that have been introduced in that, uh, in that draft of MPI. Um, Maybe taking your question a little bit further about portability. So a lot of people, when they hear about travel, they sort of assume that it's only being developed for Cray systems because Cray's leading the development. But um, you know, we recognize within the team that that's sort of uh, a clear dead end for a language if it's only supported on a single machine, that people expect their language to be portable across you know, multiple generations of machines and multiple vendors and to work on their laptop and their cluster. So both in the design of the travel language itself and its implementation, we've really uh, emphasized portability uh, greatly. And, and you can run it pretty much in any machine that has a C compiler, GNU Make, um, POSIX threads, and GasNet. So speaking of that, what transports and what environments does Chapel support? So you mentioned, you know, obviously it works well on Cray machines, and you made passing references to MPI and GasNet and other things. Well, what, I mean, what operating systems, what transports do you support? Um, so in terms of operating systems, we're pretty much support any kind of Unix-like operating system. Um, and then also the SIGWIN environment, which I'm not sure how you would categorize that. But, um, but in terms of transport layers, um, we, uh, Brad said we primarily target um, our communication to GasNet. So that supports just generic UDP and um, MPI and all sorts of all the other sort of native um, transports on the big machines. Um, and other than that, we have a custom in-house uh, version of the uh, communication layer for Cray machines. Um, we have in the past supported directly MPI and um, a couple of other interfaces, but we don't right now support them in our releases. Yes, we used to have a direct port of our communication API down to MPI. Um, the argument being kind of for portability's sake, but because GasNet has a conduit that builds on top of MPI, it felt sort of redundant in the sense that if you're going to rely on MPI as the underlying communication substrate, you might as well use GasNet's port instead of us maintaining two ports. So that's why we sort of let that retire. Um, as I may have mentioned in a, in, a, in, a, in a previous question, one of the things we've been exploring with the MPI team in Argonne is uh, whether the new MPI extensions would be sufficient to do kind of a native port to MPI that uh, makes use of the push and guess that have been proposed for MPI 3, or I guess accepted into MPI 3, um, and whether with that we'd get similar performance to GasNet. So with your uh, Chapel to C translator, are, you know, C is a language, but you know, not all C compilers are the same. Like, are, are you targeting a specific one? Uh, like, which C compiler should I have around if I wanted to get Chapel going? We expend a lot of effort making sure that the C we generate is as portable as possible. Um, so, for example, when we're doing our own development, we sort of, we use GCC a lot just because of its convenience, but we throw, you know, sort of the wall flag so we get all the warnings on, and we basically try to toe the line to the C99 standards as closely as possible. And the other piece of that is that in our nightly regression tests, we test against every C compiler that we have available to us. So in-house, that's like GNU, Intel, PGI, um, Cray's compilers. We have a couple of them. Um, and then we have users who are always trying it out on things like IBM. So, um, so pretty much uh, we, we do the best job we can to generate you know, the most C, portable C code possible and, and do a pretty good job of that for the most part, I think. All right. Now, you mentioned that uh, this is actually a, a fairly old effort. I think you said you started back in 2002, 2003 kind of time frame. What kind of shape is, this, is the system now? Um, can someone download it and use it? And uh, does it give good performance on, say, you know, clusters of Linux workstations versus a Cray and things like that? You talked about the portability. You didn't really talk too much about the performance portability. 
I'm sorry, I threw in a whole bunch of questions there. I, I hope you can make some sense of that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, it has been a longstanding effort, although you know, designing any new language takes a long time. So the first several years of the project uh, were basically spent trying to figure out exactly what did we want to build. We knew we wanted to do new language. We knew we wanted to be more productive. But it took a long time to really figure out exactly what should be in the language and should not be in the language. Um, so that said, as far as what's pasted in today, um, you can download it. It's hosted at the SourceForge page. I'm sure we'll put the link to that in the uh, web page for this uh, podcast. And um, you basically can download it, build it, as Sung said, pretty much for any Unix system um, that has a you know, pretty standard C compiler or GNU make that are sort of the minimal requirements on um, POSIX threads, I guess. Um, as far as performance, uh, so performance can be really hit or miss with Chapel today. Um, there are a number of optimizations that we have planned that we know we need to do. Um, we just haven't gotten to yet. So generally speaking, our implementation approach has been to uh, implement the features that we think are key and get them working right first so that we can get them out to potential users and get feedback from them as to whether these are the features that they want and need. You know, is this a language that would be useful to them uh, you know, if it became production grade? And that's been really useful because we've gotten a lot of great feedback and improved the language based on, uh, on those initial users who've been kicking the tires. Um, and then sort of once a feature is sort of figured out, then we go back and work on improving the performance. Um, and uh, we've done a number of things from a research perspective in the language that have, you know, maybe given us challenges from a performance perspective. So one of them is that all arrays in the language, um, whether local to a single locale or distributed across multiple locales, are written in Chapel using Chapel itself. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that, um, is, we think it's necessary to be a very general, flexible, general-purpose language. We think it's one of the things that killed HPF and ZPL in the 90s, was not being able to specify your own array distributions. Um, but at the same time, that takes a lot of knowledge away from the compiler that uh, means you have to make up some ground in order to get your array performance back to what you'd get if you were doing it by hand in MPI, say. Um, so maybe just to wrap up that, this answer, um, we usually encourage people, if they are interested in Chapel, to download it, kick the tires, try out some key items that matter to them, and see whether they like the features, um, to not judge it based on the performance today, but to sort of see, you know, extrapolate what would this be like if, if we continued working on it. Um, so the argument we make is that, you know, if any language is going to come out that's sort of truly revolutionary and truly generalizes parallel programming and makes it more productive, it's not going to show up fully formed on day one with perfect performance. So, you know, you can either work on it in secret for years, or you can work on it out in the open and show people your dirty laundry. So a lot of people today try it, they see bad performance, and they give up. But most people, we, we ask, like, okay, so are there sort of key things that you think will prevent it from getting to performance as we put more time into it? Most people can't really point to much that's sort of inherently flawed. It's just a matter of putting in the time to optimize it, and that's something we're continuing to do. So what's the long-term support for Chapel look like? Uh, I mean, is... Is DARPA still putting money into this, and there's like a another ten years guaranteed plan? Like, if I develop something and keep iterating it, will I still have a working chapel installed ten years from now? That's a really good question. Um, so we're in a we're in an interesting junction right now, where the HPCS program just wrapped up this past fall. Um, I think we finished our final deliverables within the chapel team in October, and there were some things at Supercomputing last year to kind of you know tie a nice bow around the HPCS program. And um, we know that both Cray and our users are really interested in seeing Chapel go forward. And we're currently trying to establish, you know, what's that going to look like? What's the funding model going to be? Um, what's the support model going to be? And we're sort of in the middle of figuring that all out. So I hope we'll have a more concrete answer to what does the precise future look like for Chapel, sort of, you know, by supercomputing at the very latest, although hopefully much sooner. Um, but at this point, it's, it's a little bit cloudy, other than to say that Everyone seems cautiously optimistic that something will, will keep it going forward. Um, the other thing, I guess, as far as sort of, you know, your ability to rely on it going forward is everything we've done so far is open source. So if, for example, Cray pulled the plug on it, um, there's nothing to prevent, um, you know, someone else from running with it outside of Cray. Uh, and that's sort of, I think, an important part of designing any new language is to keep it open source so that, you know, the end of life of, of one one aspect of the project doesn't mean an end of life for the project itself. And that's another reason we've developed these collaborations, is sort of grow a community uh, for Chapel that's not just sort of Cray-centric, sort of to have more people outside of Cray understanding how the runtime works, how the compiler works, things like that. 
Now, you mentioned that uh, Chapel is open source. What is its specific license? It's currently licensed with a BSD license, um, so it's quite permissive as far as how it can be used. Um, we've talked at times about switching to an Apache license, um, the main reason being that Apache comes not only with a nice permissive license, but also with um, a sort of uh, formal uh, contributors agreement. BSD doesn't really have that, so at times there have been questions about, you know, what's the right, what's the best way to manage contributors agreements for, for developers on Chapel. Um, we haven't made that switch yet, but we always are sort of thinking about it, particularly if it would allow someone to contribute who couldn't contribute under the BSD license. Okay. Hey, look at the bars bounce. Uh, okay. So We're you perfect. mentioned. I'll try this at home. Yeah. <laughs> See. <laughs> I'll shut up. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Fail, 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 fail. Okay, maybe we'll get this going. Okay, uh, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned uh, locality for GPUs and stuff. Does the Chapel language itself make use of, can you do Chapel down to CUDA or Chapel down to magic Intel preprocessor statements for fees? Like, can it make 20,000 threads on a GPU? Like, does it have a way of handling these? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. One we've been getting a lot recently, as you can imagine. Um, the answer today is sort of yes and no. Uh, the main thing we've done with GPUs so far has been a collaborative effort with uh, a student at University of Illinois named Albert Sedelnik. And uh, he interned with us one summer and then went back to school and continued working on a port of Chapel to GPUs. Uh, essentially what he did was, I mentioned you can build your own arrays in Chapel. He basically built an array that was sort of an array that targeted GPUs. So if you declared an array of that type and did operations over it, that would result in, you know, uh, the computation and, and the array being stored on the, on the GPU. Um, so that was a really good proof of concept, and that exists in a branch of our source tree, but it's never really been hardened to the point that we've incorporated it fully into Trunk. Um, and then within the core team, we haven't done much with GPUs, primarily because under the DARPA HPCS program, the Cascade architecture that we were developing, at least as defined out of the program, didn't have GPUs in it. Um, now, since then, of course, uh, Craig's been putting GPUs into products. We've been looking at Intel Micro as well going into the future. Um, so this is clearly an important part of Craig's roadmap as well as other vendors and something that we need to play catch up on. So um, one of our goals for the coming year is to basically take some of the ideas that Albert worked on at University of Illinois um, and combine that with this hierarchical locale concept I mentioned before, the idea of um, putting locales within locales to talk about uh, different types of resources within a compute node and to basically start talking about targeting a GPU locale. Um, so our goal there is to sort of take those two technologies, bring them together, um, bring it up to the point that we can put it into trunk and make it part of the, the sort of main release. Um, but that's, that's sort of ongoing work. So does that mean with this like locale and locale, you know, if it's going to handle GPU as well, does that also mean that chapels in general is probably, you know, with the locales being different islands of, characteristics or performance would work very well in a hetero, a, a truly heterogeneous environment of any type? So it's certainly designed to be. Um, again, with this theme of talking in terms of locality and parallelism and not talking about sort of specific capabilities like one-sided or two-sided message passing or specific granulators of parallelism, the idea is that it would be a very general language and be able to support heterogeneity. And we've had some initial experiences along those lines. Um, we had an implementation for a while part of it on a Linux machine and part of it on a Sun machine. Um, that's an effort that sort of has fallen by the wayside, but certainly the language itself is, is capable of doing that. Um, there's obviously a certain amount of engineering and wiring to make that really robust. So with all this work that's going on and, and understanding the chapel is still, you know, relatively early, is there any real world use of this out there? Are there people using chapel? for actual scientific computations, or is it more still in the trial, kick the tires kind of stages? Um, I think it's probably accurate to say it's primarily in the trial stage, but I think the important thing to say is that we have a number of very interested users, both within the government sector, DOE and DOD, and in industry, although the industry people normally don't want us to say who they are. Um, so there are a number of users who are sort of really anxious to use this in a production setting, but of course, they need the performance and the robustness of the implementation to catch up a bit before they're able to put their full weight on it. Um, so I'd say the interest is there, and certainly there are lots of, there's lots of tire kicking going on with sort of increasingly large and interesting codes as time goes on. Um, but to my knowledge anyway, I'm not aware of, you know, say, you know, production applications 
in government or industry that are relying on Chapel today. And frankly, I think that's appropriate. It would worry me a little bit if, if that were the case, um, given where we are today. Okay, now something I, I tend to ask a lot of software developers, and it's pure curiosity on my part, um, simply because I love to hear the answers of this. What uh, source control system do you use, and and why? <laughs> um, we use Subversion. It's hosted at SourceForge, and as for the why, um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think Subversion is a really simple model to understand, um, and it it does the job for us. We have a number of contributors, particularly outside of Cray, who've really advocated for moving to something like um, Git. Uh, and we have not done that yet, in part just because of the effort required to switch between different systems. But in part also, I just haven't really fully gotten my head around Git yet. Um, maybe I'm too old for it or something. Uh, but the sort of I have this fear of not having a really well-defined trunk that I'm going to use for my nightly testing and my releases. And I understand you can set that up by convention in Git, but sort of the fluidness of Git makes me nervous about that. Um, we do have some developers who use Git to create branches off of our subversion tree and do some work there and then contribute patches back to the subversion tree. And that seems to work really well for them, um, maybe to the point that we'll stick with subversion for sort of the trunk uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay, so for the last thing here, what, what's, what's coming into future? It seems like it's you know incubating still to some degree. What's... What's some of the what's the short term things for Chapel and what's the long term things for Chapel? Well, so uh, as I sort of alluded to, one of the big things for us is figuring out sort of what does the Chapel program look like um, going on from here. Um, and part of that is sort of how do you know how do we want to continue to uh, move forward with our team here at Cray? But there's also a question about how do we transition Chapel from being sort of very much a Cray driven technology to much more of a community owned technology. So ultimately. Uh, it's our intention that there be sort of an external chapel foundation that's sort of independent of Cray and that invested users and developers are sort of bought into that and have more say over the direction of language. But figuring out how we get from here to there is definitely an organizational challenge going forward. And then on the technical side, we talked about the, the desire and need to target GPUs and mics and sort of other emerging um, processor technologies. So that's going to be a big emphasis going forward. Um, improving the performance uh, is, is always an emphasis and something we need to spend more time on, so that's going to be an emphasis going forward. Um, and then going back and sort of backfilling some of the features that were maybe in the dark corners for HPCS, not on the critical path, but are crucial to end users, um, I think is sort of a third big theme for the coming years. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Where can people find more information and get involved with the Open Source Project for Chapel? Yeah, so the, the sort of single point to know about for getting involved with Chapel is chapel.cray.com. That's our main website that has a number of, uh, inf you know, a lot of information, presentation, tutorials, things like that. It's also got the link to where you can download it. Um, it's got our contact information. So that's sort of your one-stop shop for learning more about Chapel. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate thank you. it.